sometimes you have to wait. Sometimes the legal system may not seem fair. And sometimes it seems to favor those with deep pockets. But you can go to court. How many people here think they might go to law school? All right, four, five. There was a judge in the United States who very often recognizes perhaps one of the greatest judges never to sit on the Supreme Court. In other words, a very esteemed federal judge with the rather odd, old-fashioned name, Learned Hand. His first name was Learned. And his, his family name was Hand. Learned Hand, a very famous judge. Here's what he says about getting ready for law school or legal training. It is as important to a judge called upon to pass on a question of constitutional law to have at least a bowing acquaintance with Acton and Maitland. Acton is a British um, uh, figure, Lord Acton, who was involved in diplomacy and law, with Thucydides. Imagine that. Thucydides is whom? <laughs> Thucydides wrote the uh, history of the Peloponnesian War. Yeah, he's, a, he's an ancient Greek historian. He writes a history about conflict and all the motives for that conflict. Gibbon, who's Gibbon? Author of The Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire. One of the great works of Western history. Why did Rome fall apart? Why was it great for a while and why eventually did it disintegrate? Carlyle, Carlyle's a 19th century writer. Homer, Dante. Shakespeare, Milton, Machiavelli, yes, a list of dead white males here. But today we would add many other writers who are individuals who have observed human nature. So for example, I would add somebody like Jane Austen because she understands human motivation and virtue. Justice Felix Frankfurter advised someone going to law school, the best way to prepare for the law is to come to the study of the law as a well-read person. Thus alone can one acquire the capacity to use the English language on paper and in speech with the habits of clear thinking which only a truly liberal education can give. Meaning wide acquaintance, different disciplines, different subject matters, and the ability to extract information and, and points of view from them to judge their quality. And I would add, too, these days, increasingly in our society, some ability at statistical analysis, some ability to read data. You just can't get through judgments without, uh, not every judgment, but you can't get through many judgments without knowing how to interpret statistical data. But that's part of a liberal education, too, in the arts and sciences. So there's a view of two very famous jurists about what is really necessary in the law in order to contribute to the courts as some sort of independent body that judges and draws lines and that helps people when they come to the courts with a suit. It's a very capacious list. It's a very remarkable list. So change in a democracy sometimes occurs at an agonizingly slow rate. That's one of its ills. So Susan B. Anthony is testifying before Congress about women getting the vote in 1887. And when do women get the vote? Yeah, it's a lot later, isn't it? 30 some years later. Things move slowly in a democracy sometimes. And they move in a zigzag fashion. It's just something you have to put up with. You can't expect things to change overnight. This implies going into something for the long haul. It implies not being a fair weather friend to a certain cause. It implies knowing how to lose so you can win again later. And it implies some sort of ability to join with other people. It's a very rare person who alone can change a system. That person needs, in some sense, to band together with other people and to be a leader. 
So let's take a quick look. If you have, do you have your source book? If not, I'll just read a little from it. This is uh, on page 156, 157 of the source book. I know this print is like five points high, so it's tough for me, but I'll try to do my best. So a group of women come in to Congress to testify before senators about the importance of giving women the vote. Women first get the vote in the United States where, do you know? It's hard. It probably, this is a trick question. It is a trick question. Anybody know? I think, I think I've got this right. I think it's in the state of Wyoming. Well, but it's a rough and tumble frontier place, and you've got to be a really strong woman out there to get anything done and, and to, um, you know, stand up for your rights. And I think it's in Wyoming that women first get the vote, interestingly enough. But here it is, 1887. Women don't have the vote. Susan B. Anthony is talking about this. And then on the, on the right-hand page, on page 157, she said uh, near the top, let, just let me read it. It's hard to follow because of the size type. I not only was denied my right to testify as to whether I voted or not, but there was not one single woman's voice to be heard nor to be considered except as witnesses, save when it came to the judge asking, has the prisoner anything to say why sentence should not be pronounced? Neither as judge, as attorney, nor as jury was I allowed any person who would be legitimately called my peer to speak for me. When you're judged in a jury trial, you're supposed to be judged by whom? Your peers. That's right. So it's one, no, but no woman can stand up for this woman. Do we have a similar problem sometimes today in trials? What would be the analogous problem today? What if you're in a southern town 30 years ago and you're African American and you're up for trial and you are put in front of a judge of 12 people who are all white? Fair? Probably not. Was that done? Yep. Done all the time. Is there some question about balancing jury pools today in order to try to get a relative jury of your peers? Yes, there is. There should be. So she says, let me remind you that in the case of all other classes of citizens, under the shadow of our flag, you've been true to the theory that taxation and representation are inseparable. Were women taxed if they owned property? Yes. I mean, this is before the income tax is instituted. But here you are, you're a woman, you own property, you pay taxes. I mean, that's the great cry of every American who doesn't feel they have adequate representation. I pay taxes. I'm a taxpayer. And she's saying, I pay taxes. Do I have any representation? No. Why not? I can't vote. So what is the government doing? It is extracting from me something and it is giving me no voice in the transactions of the government whatsoever. No voice at all. Then there's this funny little exchange down below. It's sort of interesting. She's uh, been talking about another woman who's had to pay taxes. And Mrs. Spencer says, is it because she is a citizen? Please explain. Miss Anthony said, because she is black. Is it because the 14th and 15th Amendments made women citizens? Certainly, because it declared the black people to be citizens. So that's an interesting argument. If those amendments declared everyone who was black to be a citizen, they ought to have declared black women to be citizens. It's an interesting syllogistic argument. But no, the senators won't actually hear of that. So she says, gentlemen, you have before you various propositions of amendment to the federal constitution. One is for the election of president by the vote of the people direct the people. And then she says rather caustically, of course, women are not people. It's what we call a good example of irony. <laughs> of course, women are not people. And then Senator Edmonds says, very foolishly, I think, he says, angels. He says, women are angels. Now this plays into a, ve yes, this plays into a very old stereotype of the 19th century. Women are angels of the house. They lead domestic life. They are, yes, I know, I know, Kelly, I know. It gets nuts, but that's what, the, that's what the theory was. They are to be venerated and worshiped even in their domestic role as angels of the house. 
they are angels. So in other words, you call them the highest thing you can and you keep the vote from them. And so she, sa she says, she's very quick, yes, angels up in heaven or else devils down there. In other words, that's the way you treat women, as angels up in heaven or as devils down there, one or the other. There are all sorts of names for this in the study of psychology. Their name is legion. The, the, the slang word for it isn't very polite, but you know it's either the, the old thing that either women are the most pure things or they're the, the most impure things. It's a terrible dichotomy. So she says, yes, angels up in heaven or else devils down there. And then Edmonds, who's getting a little flustered, says, I have never known any of that kind. Now, you have to understand the implications of 19th century society here. Basically, what she is saying is, that's right, you treat women that way, and then you use them as if they were a kind of prostitute. And Edmonds immediately says, I've never known any of that kind, and backs away. Anthony's testimony goes on. It's eloquent. It's well argued. It's based in law. It's intelligent and women don't get the vote. And they don't get it for decades. It's a problem. We turn to another issue. You have, in our own words, turn to page 68. Margaret Sanger was a great woman spokesperson for women's rights. Now, this is 102 years ago, 1916. And she first starts talking about religious propaganda. And she says that advocates, this is on the very bottom of the page, advocates of birth control are not seeking to attack the Catholic Church. Why would she mention the Catholic Church? Because they were a big, um, they were a big proponent against birth control because of, um, yeah, I mean, they were one of the biggest, I don't know, yes. people that she was arguing against. So yes. she needs to mention the, them. The, the teachings of the Catholic Church was that birth control should not be permitted. The teaching of the Catholic Church was so prevalent that when I was a student, you couldn't obtain birth control in Massachusetts. Women couldn't. And the condoms were held in an almost secret place in the drugstore where you really had to look hard for them. <laughs> it was true when I was your age. You couldn't get birth control in Massachusetts at that time, the late 60s early 70s. The law was soon changed after that. We quarrel with the church, she says, however, when it seeks to assume authority over non-Catholics and to dub their behavior immoral because they do not conform to the dictatorship of Rome. Now, this is harsh language, but it's not entirely different from what Mario Cuomo would later say in the 1980s. Mario Cuomo was governor of New York. You ever see Chris Cuomo on CNN? Or he's a news broadcaster. He's, he's uh, Mario Cuomo's son. And Mario Cuomo's other son is now governor of New York. So it's kind of a political family. But Mario Cuomo's statement in the 1980s was essentially that he was a Catholic and he wanted to lead his private life according to the teachings of the Catholic Church. But as a public figure, he knew that the country was not entirely Catholic. Far from it. And so he was not going to impose the teachings of that church as a matter of policy on the entire public. Why? Because particularly perhaps in this country, but in many other countries, a democracy has people from different backgrounds, different religious systems, different values, different beliefs. And how strongly are these beliefs held? Very strongly. Very strongly, like this. They are beliefs about life and death. They are beliefs about what is right and what is wrong. And people in this country do not agree always about that. They simply do not agree. And they are going to write and protest and dissent and try to get judges appointed and do everything they can to see that their beliefs prevail. Is that OK? Yes, it's a democracy. It's OK to do that as long as you're not breaking the law. It's OK. 
So that makes democracy rough and tumble. It makes it uncomfortable. It makes it contentious in a direct way. But Sanger goes on to say, for having convinced men and women that only in this baldly propagative phase, meaning only have sex if you're going to have children, that's what she's saying, is sexual expression legitimate? So in other words, part of her argument is that for women, sexual expression should be something that they decide upon themselves, and the state should not completely restrict it only for the purpose of having children. Now, you can say, well, our attitudes sure have changed. Not so fast. The attitudes of many people may have changed. Not the attitudes of everyone. Moral and sexual balance, and then these are remarkable sentences from Sanger. This is farther down on 69. Moral and sexual balance in civilization will only be established by the assertion and expression of power on the part of women, by women. This is a remarkable claim in 1916. What's going on about this time in the United Kingdom? Well, no, that doesn't happen until much later. Birth control pill isn't invented until much later in the 20th century. What are women doing in the United Kingdom at this time? Suffragette. suffragette movement. The suffragettes are chaining themselves to buildings. They are marching. They are being thrown in prison. And then when they are in prison, what are the suffragettes doing? That's what the protesters in Ireland did often during the Troubles. What do you do? You're in prison. You have control left only over one thing. They refuse to eat. They refuse to eat. That's right. I won't eat. I will starve. And then, then what happens? What does the law do then? Does the law want to let you die? No. So what does the law do? It force feed you. That's right. Yeah. That's pretty awful. So Sanger's speaking at the time when suffragettes in Britain are undergoing that kind of treatment. Women's power can only be expressed and make itself felt when she refuses the task of bringing unwanted children into the world. And then this sentence, this part of the sentence, which is quite remarkable, and for some people undercut her case. When women refuses to bring unwanted children into the world, to be exploited in industry and slaughtered in wars. Now, what does that part of the sentence do to change her argument some? To be exploited by industry and slaughtered in wars. What does that suggest? Well, suddenly, it's not just about sexual rights. Suddenly, it's about uh, capitalism and, and pacifism. That's correct. And it's about World War I, too. It's about the Great War. So Sanger had. A, a number of beliefs to, to which he was passionately dedicated. And those beliefs are taken together for her. They're inseparable. But in this case, she has put them together. Now, when you put beliefs together like that, what does that have the possibility of doing with some of your supporters? It potentially alienates people that would have agreed with her point. Yeah, on it might. Rate, but yeah. Exactly. And how often have you seen movements split because people within the movement couldn't agree? The, the movement for women's rights in the middle of the 19th century was strongly bound up with another very important movement in American history that we don't think about much anymore. But boy, it was a very, very important movement. And that was the movement not to drink what? Alcohol, whiskey, the temperance movement. And the temperance people and the women's rights movement, they sometimes didn't get along. And people said, we have to make the most important thing women's rights. No, we have to make the most important thing temperance. The amount of, <laughs> the amount of hooch being drunk by some American males in the 19th century was staggering. It was. And it was causing all kinds of domestic problems, violence, domestic violence, crime. And the temperance did the temperance movement ever triumph in the United States? 
Yes, it did. And what was its triumph? Prohibition. Can't buy alcohol. Prohibition lasts for, for a while. There are all kinds of attempts to circumvent it. But for a while, you couldn't buy a drink. It didn't matter how old you were. Well, you could buy a drink if you knew where the illegal stuff was. But basically, you couldn't. And you were subject to the law, and people were arrested. So the temperance movement won for a while. And then prohibition was repealed. It's just another example of the flux of what goes on in a democracy.